At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, hello and, and welcome to another Drug Science Podcast. Tonight I have one of the, one of the living legends in the field of drug harm reduction. The man who pioneered the very, maybe invented the actual concept. I don't know. He'll tell us about that later. His name is John Marks. And if you haven't heard about him, then you're probably only, he must be under 30 or so. So welcome, John. <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Welcome. A lot of the listeners to this podcast will really have very little understanding of, of what we are talking about. So let's go back to the beginning and just tell us a bit about your stuff and how you ended up being a an addiction psychiatrist in, in Liverpool and then what it was like the, in those days and then we can start to develop the history because of what was actually quite a, a seminal moment. Okay I uh, graduated in Edinburgh was gonna do uh, I didn't know what I was gonna do my father was a GP so I thought I'd try uh, obstetrics, pediatrics, psychiatry which they all had to do. Obstetrics then the next job that came up was psychiatry. Fell in love with that. There was a chap called John Gleiser did the Manchester rotation with David Goldberg. Oh, yeah. okay. I wrote for him. And then went on to become senior in Shaw with uh, Jim Higgins in Liverpool. He was a forensic psychiatrist. I moved from there to a lecturer to John Copeland at the university. It was all the kind of senior in Shaw rotation. Yeah, and so I applied to uh, Witness, which was nearby, and the Witness, which is called the Halton Health Authority, but it's Witness run corner and bits and bobs around, mm -hmm. and along with five others, Witness, Warrington, Wigan, a lot of these W towns, industrial yeah. towns in Liverpool, Manchester, operated out of Winnick Asylum, which was then one of the biggest uh -huh. asylums. And each of us consultants had a brief for the general adult psychiatry in our respective towns. But then one of the six would take on a specialty for all five others. Uh -huh. So one guy would do the mental handicap for yep. all six of us. Another would do elderly for all six of us. I was a new boy. They are, John, you've got the addicts, the alcoholics and the okay. drugs. I see. So it, I, it was thrust upon you. It was thrust upon me entirely. And I uh, started on a Thursday at this drug clinic in Witness where I came in a lovely old guy called Sid, retired docker, with a very nice wife and three lovely kids for his tot of junk. He'd been going for 20 years or something. And you wouldn't tell him from you or me. Perfectly yep. healthy looking, reasonable, witty guy. Mm -hmm. I found the whole exercise a bit boring, a bit like being a shopkeeper, and I moaned to my uh, colleague, Bert Brooker, who'd been running it up to then and happily dumped it. <laughs> but this is, this is a load of nonsense. And he said, don't worry about it, John. It works. Mm. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, I think Bert must have been a bit... One of... Uh, who recommended me, one of my references when I took up the consultancy post, was Kevin White, who was the chap in Liverpool, right? the Liverpool mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. addiction thing, said that I could be a bit enthusiastic. That's the only negative thing he said. <laughs> but perhaps born by this, said, look, leave it alone. It works. Let's be clear. Let's make people understand. This is what would, the Americans would call the British system. As exactly. you mentioned the Rolleston Report, which I think was in the 1920s, and it, you know, one of the several attempts that the British doctors made to not to be railroaded into the American prohibition model, wasn't it? And it, and it allowed you to prescribe opiates, particularly heroin, to, to addicts. Is that right? Is it, do you want to just explain it? 
basically, Rolleston said the government, the state should not get between a doctor and his patient, a bit like lawyers and their clients. Mm -hmm. And the upshot of that was that doctors in the real world would come across people like Sid, who managed a perfectly reasonable life, held down a job, brought up a family, provided they had their tot of junk. I mean, people have like likened it to uh, the diabetic surviving on insulin. Yep. Not that I think that's a, a good parallel, but, you know, in the uh, ultimate way things work, it looks mm -hmm. very similar. And these guys functioned absolutely normally, so long as they got the tot junk. And Rawlston said, look, this is reasonable. Efforts should be maintained to try and get them off, just as like you might cure a diabetic and get him off insulin, if that were possible. But that you continue the supply of drugs if stopping it leads to more harm and more distress than otherwise. And that's what prevailed from 1926 up until 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act. Mm, mm, mm. The Misuse of Drugs Act in 1971 basically maintained that Rolleston system, but restricted it right. from general practitioners, all of whom had the odd one in his practice and knew him very well, which was always very helpful, mm. and knew his files and what he'd get up to, mm. and restricted the consultant psychiatrists, one in each health district who would provide... Uh, a similar service for all the addicts in his patch, which may be 10, 20, 100 or yep. more. So I was going along with what was the norm. Yep. Then throughout the uh, 70s, there were these pushes, chiefly from London, mm -hmm. to know we've got to get everybody off. This maintenance of everybody is not good. And I think that wellspring, that atmosphere, came from America. Yeah. And what was it? Nixon's war on drugs was declared in 72. Yep. And so things gradually ratcheted up, I suppose, from then. But of course, these things take time, and the good news had reached London, but it hadn't reached the sticks. And we were just plodding along in the old tried and tested way. And wasn't a problem. I think what really kicked it into gear was, well, two things. Firstly, Mrs. Thatcher, mm -hmm. as was her wont, was fond of empirical tests. I think she was a scientist, a chemist, if I remember, and told the social workers, find out what works, sort this out. The next thing was that came on the political intray was the drug problem. And Thatcher said, right, well, find out what works and yeah. gave out, I think it was two million, mm -hmm. which um, divided out, let's say, 20,000 per health district. Uh, look at what works. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, we'll look at this Ralston Clinic that I was running in witness, show that it makes the problem worse, and take the money and build a new schizophrenic hostel or something. Yep, yep. Which was my expectation. I was very sceptical of it. We did a little survey of... Witness, which had this Rolston Clinic at, uh, just south of Liverpool, and we compared it with Bootle, a mm. similar town just north of Bootle, mm. of just north of Liverpool, yeah. which for historical reasons didn't have a psychiatrist right. prescribing, or or they might have had one, but he was a you know treatment only chap. I, I can't remember. Yep. And we showed quite a dramatic mm. decrease in crime, increase in health. No deaths at all. Yeah. And perhaps most surprising, I kind of thought, well, if you get clean drugs instead of dirty drugs, yep. it's more healthy. If you don't have to go and burgle to get the drugs, yeah, there'll be less crime. Yep. But I thought, you know, it would spread more. We found the opposite. Yeah. A 15 fold reduction in uh, incidence of new cases of addiction. I published this in. Uh, the proceedings of the Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, in 91. And that kind of set me back. I thought, oh, God, there's something in this. And then quickly in the wake of discovering that empirical phenomenon, I suppose you have to thank Thatcher a bit for saying do that. Yeah. 
yeah. but she didn't get much thanks in Liverpool. But then came AIDS and a panic over that. And Sir Donald Wilson, the uh, chairman of the Regional Health Authority, hearing about witness, I think, said, look, come and set up a full-time clinic in Liverpool, because Liverpool, a bit like Manchester and these big cities, needed somebody full-time because there were so many of addicts. So uh, I was reluctant. That was my cup of tea. And Bert Brooker, a colleague, you scratch the region's back. They'll yeah. scratch ours and we'll get something out of it. So I said, OK, I'll do you. Um, I went there. Same phenomenon occurred. Falling crime. Improved health. Not a single case of HIV. And reduction in incidence, <laughs> which the police were very pleased about. And Marks and Spencer were so impressed in the drop in shoplifting from the city centre store that they put up, I think it was 90 grand for the first harm reduction conference in 1990. Wow. So that's a replication. You did an audit yeah. and then you did a replication. So it kind of yeah. pretty pretty convincing by then, yes. Yeah. And, of course, it had started attracting the press and yeah. all these yeah. kind of characters because, of course, drugs was like rock and roll and sex, yeah. something yeah. that makes the news. Yeah. And all these guys started coming talk to me. And I, being a bit naive, thought, well, this is good hard science, empirical news, good news, yeah. spread the good word and say, yes, it works, da, 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 da. They all got very excited. And fortunately, the health minister at the time, a chap called Norman Fowler, yep. very shrewd cookie, very good. He looked at the stats, looked at everything and said, this works, and rolled out a similar drug dependency clinic, harm reduction strategy to be adopted in every health district of the country. Mm -hmm. That's really when it was on a roll. And as I say, the press got more and more interested. The Home Office drugs branch, which were policing us, mm -hmm. headed up by a chap called Bing Spear, lovely guy, were probably our biggest supporters of all because they were trying to persuade the London Right. Psychiatrist to take on the hordes of addicts that couldn't yeah. get the script. And as I say, there were these cameramen coming and newspaper journalists and everything. And there was one lot that came from America called 60 Minutes. Oh, yes, yes. And they made a, a video. They was about six months later, it was screened. And then one day I got a cold call from Bing Spear. John, why didn't you tell us about 60 Minutes? I said, what do you mean, what's 60 Minutes? He said, we're getting real heat from our embassy in Washington. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they did a thing on your clinic and they really got the knickers of a twist over somebody getting a prescription of crack. Actually, it's one, one single patient out of 200 or whatever it was. I see. And he said, I said to Bing, look, Bing, I get bloody journalists and people yeah. who, and they always ask the same questions. What is a drug? What is a, it's boring. <laughs> uh, your legs off. They're totally ignorant. They want all this stuff. And I forget from one day to the next. So we had folk from Germany, France, uh, Australia yep. even, yep. coming and doing pieces. And I said, I don't remember this American outfit. Then he sent me the video and had a look at it. And it was a well put together piece that yep. showed our yep. thing fairly. Yep. I could see why the Americans were upset about it because it showed that prescribing a ration of cocaine worked and there was a patient in the sample. But I said, look, I mean, that's the way it is. And I was a bit naive because basically it's a bit like saying, well, I don't know, the truth if you let's say the coronavirus, and if you're a scientist who find out, look, actually, the vaccine doesn't work and corona is a little more than the flu, let's suppose that's your view. But you're a, a gen scientist who's found that. Oh, no, that's disinformation. Can't be spoken because it goes against the narrative. Well, basically, I found this out about prescribing, reducing the black market availability of drugs. 
oh, God, goes against the narrow loaf, kind of that. And I hadn't realized that kind of mechanism was in play, which so was a bit naive. I think at that time it probably wasn't until that, until, as you say, until, well, certainly Nixon would have provoked it. But but I, I had a suspicion that, that pressure came from Reagan. To, to... Oh, I don't know. You may be right. All I know is that we got a lot of political flack. Yes. And eventually Maggie, who owed Reagan one over the Falklands War. Yeah, yeah. Caved and said, okay, we've got to keep the Americans on side. Close that down. And then <laughs> it was rather funny because Bink said, well, actually, you can't. What he's doing is legal. And we support it. Da, 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 da. So she said, well, we're going to satisfy the Americans. And they hit upon a wheeze of dissolving the Witness and Warrington Health Authorities, which were two separate <laughs> authorities, which meant that a new health authority mm -hmm. had to be, because they joined them and formed, called them the North Cheshire Health Authority, which really annoyed Witness and Warrington because there's cities in yep. Lancashire. Yep, yep. <laughs> and this North Cheshire Health Authority, of course, would have to be new appointees. Mm -hmm. And they took great care to see that all the new appointees, or at least the majority of them, were born again prohibitionists, you know, yeah. church type people, whatever, who were, I shouldn't say religious church type, because actually many of the church folk that I come into contact with, the Methodists, <laughs> even the leaders, some of them, were very supportive. They thought this was very helpful. But long and the short of it was that this new authority then placed its took its contract away from Witness Hospital, the Witness Clinic, yeah. and gave the contract for managing addiction to some book, residential, yeah. Yeah. you know, recovery place. And, of course, they all went back to the streets. Poor yeah. Sid, who'd been fine for 20, 30 years, was six months later, he was dead from because he'd lost all his contacts with the, the market and yeah. he got a, overdose, I suppose, or some bad stuff. I feel, feel a bit guilty about that, that my enthusiasm for what I'd found had ended up cutting him off from his supply and he was dead. But eventually, I mean, the whole country then conceded, didn't it? I mean, it well, well, not completely. There were just a few rather secret places that were still doing it under the radar, so to speak. But Could have carried on, but you've got to it's very high threshold. And also, I think, if they'd been on for donkey's years, basically, if you hadn't shouted your mouth up and said, look, this, shouted your mouth off, as I did, and say, look, this works, they'd have been happy. But I, I shouted my mouth off and said, look, actually, this works. We should start questioning the way we're running the addiction services. Hi there, curious minds and seekers of knowledge. If you're passionate about understanding the science behind drugs or their impact on society, we've got something exciting for you. If you're looking to bridge the gap between cutting edge research and practical applications, you should find out more about our recently launched consultancy arm of drug science. As of 2024, Drug Science has opened up a brand new consultancy service that brings evidence-based solutions to the forefront of drug policy and public health. Whether you are a policymaker, you work in biotech and drug discovery, or you're part of an organisation navigating the complex landscape of drug-related issues, Drug Science Consultancy is here to guide you. Our team of experts combine years of research experience with a commitment to evidence-based decision-making. From scoping the literature, to developing clinical trials or providing educational programmes, we can tailor our services to meet your unique needs. So don't just stay informed, become a driving force of positive change with Drug Science Consultancy. Visit drugscience.org.uk slash consultancy today or check the show notes for a direct link. Well, that's why I was that... so keen to talk to you because I just want to share this, I want to share this wonderful anecdote from someone else who shouted his mouth off about evidence policy. Yeah. Mine obviously was even less useful than yours. Mine was more more sort of theoretical yours was actually practical evidence but I remember when I was sacked 
I think you were probably one of the very first people to contact me. And you sent me an email. I believe you were in North Island, New Zealand. And you sent me an email saying, David, David, it's wonderful out here. Come and join me. I'm fascinated to know what what happened there. Did you resign? I suppose you weren't reappointed. So you were effectively made redundant, weren't you? What what have you done? What did you do then? Ah, well, when the health authority started closing us down, I thought I couldn't with a clear conscience put up with this and took what were called extra contractual referrals, properly referred from neighbouring GPs, and it limped along. But it obviously wasn't going to go very far far for very long and then out of the blue i got a call from john gleiser the guy i trained with in manchester Mm -hmm. who was then in new zealand said look new zealand and australia and several other places want to set up a similar service to you we'll appoint you as the clinical director for the wellington drug addiction unit and roll that out right and not many people get such a nice offer to such a nice place when they're 50 so I said, yep, yeah, I'll go for that. And off I went and set up in 98, that was, as clinical director of the Wellington Addiction Service. I was there maybe two, maybe three years. And there was a guy called Jeff Robinson, lovely guy, a physician mm-hmm. who was in charge of GI and liver and things. And he was particularly interested in the uh, treatment of chronic alcoholism. Mm -hmm. and liver pathology, and also uh, other addictions as far as they affect the physical body. And he's been there a long time. He's pretty high up in the system, knew the the guys in the Ministry of Health. And he came to, we got on really well, and he saw me as a good partner in crime and sorting addiction, sending in patients. And a mate of his at the Ministry of Health Mm-hmm. had got a message from the chief inspector of the Home Office Drugs Branch, mm-hmm. who had succeeded Bing Spear. And the chap who taken over was, it seemed, a hard-nosed prohibitionist mm-hmm. of the Anslinger <laughs> mold yeah. called yeah. Alan McFarlane. Yes. Oh, I know Alan. Yes. I, uh, he was a head pharmacist. That's right. Yes. And we McF- had certain battles so, in, while I was on the ACMD. Yes. Well, McFarlane wrote to uh, some opposite number in New Zealand about me. This man is dangerous. He misuses his licenses or misuses his licenses, which I never did. I mm-hmm. Absolutely dotted every I and crossed every T as Bing Spear would have happily agreed. Mm-hmm. And that sunk me as far as New Zealand government said, <gasps> oh. I think also. This was the time, a drug-free world by 2008, <laughs> and the United Nations meeting, yes. and all sorts of nonsense. And then the next thing I got in the wake of that, they couldn't fire me. So me, it was really very unpleasant. They, the manager, pretty unpleasant guy, over the immediate place, not a doctor at all, some kind of hitman who would be said, look, get rid of Marx. And basically what he did, he got his the staff, the nurses and all the others, to get patients. Are you satisfied with Mark's treatment? No, he didn't prescribe. One case, he banged the case notes down and it made me frightened. Complaint. Yeah. yeah. Complaint went in. Actually, the, that case, the chap was mentally handicapped. So it would have had to be one of his people wanted to earn some brownie points, mm-hmm. put in a complaint. I had to then write a, a reams, the medical council, explaining the situation. And they were coming very soon, at half a dozen a week, which was using up all my time, and it's very unpleasant. Yeah, and the medical defence union said, these guys are off the rails. These absolutely poisonous. I get out, John, they said because this is vindictive. They eventually got a good deal, three months salary without work, and go wherever you want to New Zealand and leave you alone. So I did that. I ended up as clinical director of psychiatry in New Zealand, in Gisborne, in the northeast, the Maori area, oh, yeah. which is it's just two degrees short of the date line. So it's as far east as you can get. 
so I was an internal exile, if you like, in New yes. Zealand. Though. But I, I saw up my time there. Very enjoyable. Really good experience. And what Lovely part of the world. Now you're in Vienna, is that right? But you were in Italy the other week when I was trying to go contact you. What, what are you doing with yourself these days? Uh, I'm not guilty of Italy, but I married, for my sins, a Viennese. Uh-huh. So that's how I ended up in Vienna. But during my last, oh, 10 years at Gisborne, mm-hmm. I had the good fortune to get a sabbatical from the local yep. health authority, and I use it to study the electroencephalogram. Okay. And basically, I found a correlation between the electroencephalogram and psychometry. Oh. Psychometry, the, the big yep. five that all psychologists use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I formulated both the theory of... Uh, addiction and of treatments of things varying from addiction to schizophrenia. I published a few papers there. One thing just to say, if you send those information on those papers to James, we'll put them up on the website when this goes live so people can make reference to them. And, and okay. also, you did write up that very famous, that paper that you published in the, you said it was Royal College of Physicians. So was that, was that the last? Edinburgh. That was... Uh, the North Wind and the Sun, back in 91. I mean, really important you, you put the reference there so people can, because that is absolutely, that is a, a true classic paper, and I want people to, uh, you know, this truly, I think, you know, it's one of the worst examples of of a non-evidence-based policy, religious, puritanical, moralistic policy that in any field, and it's certainly done in no, massive harm to, to people who use drugs, and. Well, you might have heard, I don't know if you heard, but just this, I think just last week, the current government has announced that it's going to start investing again in the treatments that you, do, you were doing re- routinely. You know, oh, I didn't know that. Yes, huh. whether it'll happen, but the yeah. <laughs> the made, cause, you know, now, you know, we, it's again still political, you know, the, the media still do have quite a, a fun trying to, you know, to raise hysteria about, about helping people inject safely and, you know what, Dave? One of the things that I found most upsetting was um, after I uh, retired and uh, left New Zealand, came to the end, I saved up all my pennies, flogged my house in New Zealand, mm-hmm. and I'd have to travel hither and yon, Inverness, Fraserburgh. Yeah, and yeah. I remember in Fraserburgh, seeing junkies on the, on the floor, uh, picturesque, Little fishing town with a very old university, now yeah. closed. As safe a place as any that you could think of. Yeah. And even that was flooded with what do they call these country lines or whatever they are. Yeah. The yeah. current policy seemed like a balloon. It stepping has. on a balloon. It's spread it everywhere. Yeah, well, that is a very good analogy, what I'm going to use in future. John, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you and uh, your legacy hopefully we'll begin to fuel the next perhaps more rational approach to to drug harm reduction thank you very much for coming on and uh, stay well and if you ever feel inclined to uh, to write pieces about lessons we've got a journal drug science policy and law which will be delighted to to publish them so i do hope you'll stay in touch thank you very much thanks dave